Give me your signal. Although it took years to perfect, the technique of sending pictures by wire is comparatively simple. Is Taxiwati was an Aztec princess who fell in love with the wrong man, a warrior named Popocatepetl. Her father, the king, sent her beloved Popocatepetl off to war, promising his daughter's hand in marriage when he returned, whilst expecting that he never would. Is Taxiwati was duly told that Popocatepetl had indeed died in battle. On hearing the news, Is Taxiwati, literally heartbroken, died from her grief. When Popocatepetl he returned from war to find Istaxiwati dead. He carried her out of Tenochtitlan and knelt down by her body. The gods then turned them both to stone and covered them with snow. Istaxiwati became a mountain and her lover Popocatepetl, filled with eternal rage at her loss, became a volcano. It's a lovely ageless story, the same one that has been told in various forms around the world since stories were first told. There is a slightly less flower one from Birmingham in England. A long time ago there were two giants, one in Birmingham Castle and one ten miles away in Dudley Castle. They had a falling out which resulted in the Dudley giant throwing a stone, a giant stone of course, from Dudley to Birmingham where it demolished the castle and killed the Birmingham giant. The stone now rests on a plinth on Warstone Lane in Birmingham. The stone is actually a glacial erratic, a boulder carried down to Birmingham during the last ice age. Like many of these large glacial erratic boulders, being out of place and inexplicable to our forebears, stories were often made up to explain them. The very human desire to explain the world in which we live is best expressed through scientific inquiry. But long before we had devised the tools and methods which now allow us to explore the world, World, we were left to rely on our imaginations and storytelling to explain away the unknown. Some might think that raw knowledge is less poetic than the fairy stories and fables of old, but I am no less awestruck by the marvellous majesty of the natural world for knowing just a tiny bit of how it hangs together. And so to the purpose of this video, a very brief geographical and geological overview of the country of Israel. The history and development of a country is heavily influenced by its geography, and that is nowhere more true than for Israel. Israel as a country has only existed since 1948. Some Jews and many others connect this with the small kingdom of Israel, which existed for a couple of hundred years, 3,000 years ago, and of course take the Bible as sufficient justification for its existence. Perhaps a video on that is warranted, but no time for it here. Enough to say that modern Israel exists because of the Bible. To understand the history of Israel, you must understand the Bible. To understand the Bible, you must understand the geography of Israel. It might be an obvious thing to say, but looking at a map of Israel does not give you a feel for the geography of the country. It's only when you view the country in relief, or three dimensions, that you start to see how the terrain has dictated the history and politics of the area. The Jordan Rift Valley, with its mountainous surrounds, provides natural protection to the coastal strip of Israel, which is why the Israelis are so keen to have control of them. As significant as the terrain is to the history of Israel, so is water, fresh water. The Bible is full of references to wells, springs and fresh water, and not surprisingly so. We mammals can survive a fair while on our food reserves, but we suffer the consequences of dehydration very quickly. Israel is 55% desert. It sits between the Sahara and Arabian deserts. The Negev desert is southern Israel. Rainfall in the south averages a little around 30 millimeters an inch or so per year, often coming in short bursts and causing flash floods. June through September are rainless across the country. A full 70% of Israel's rain falls in the north and then only between November and March. Israel has three main sources of fresh water. Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, is Israel's only large surface fresh water source. It's 20 by 13 kilometers with an average depth of under 26 meters and a maximum depth of 43 meters. The huge conical structure found in Lake Kinneret in 2003 is 10 meters tall and 10 meters below the surface. If, as is currently suggested, this stone structure was originally built on dry land, then the lake 
lake at the time was much lower than it is today. Besides Lake Kinneret, Israel relies largely on two underground aquifers, the coastal and mountain aquifers, and it is these aquifers which feed the many natural springs. Find a city mentioned in the Bible and it is very likely to be on the site of an ancient natural spring. The River Jordan, fed by the winter runoff from the northern mountains, feeds into Lake Kinneret with an overflow down the Jordan Valley and into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, actually a lake, evaporates the fresh water and grows more saline with the minerals dribbled in through the Jordan River and underground springs. The Jordan Valley itself exists because of the Dead Sea transform upon which it sits. The Dead Sea Transform is a complex fault system within the global tectonic system and is that part which extends from the Red Sea Rift in the south to the East Anatolian Fault in Turkey to the north. The Arabian Plate is moving north-northeast at about 11 millimetres per year. The huge African Plate alongside it is moving in almost the same direction but at a slightly lower speed. This results in a fault system along the plate boundaries. The Earth continually tears itself apart part here with a resulting area of subsidence we know as the Jordan Valley. The many and varied geological surveys in the area have built up a detailed picture of the history of the region. A couple of million years ago the Jordan Valley was connected to the Mediterranean and formed the Sidon Lagoon. There is evidence that this lagoon went through periods of isolation from the Mediterranean. Over time this resulted in the deposition of over two kilometers of salts. These evaporites are today concentrated in two huge salt diamonds. Diapers, the Lysen Diaper and Mount Sidon, Mount Sodom, which are both many kilometres thick. At some point, the Sidon Lagoon was cut off from the Mediterranean. This could have been due to uplift as a result of tectonic action or a sea level drop in the Mediterranean, and probably a bit of both. This resulted in a succession of lake formations in the Dead Sea Basin. The sediments record changes in water levels and salinity, indicating changes in the local climate through wetter and drier stages, and changing shorelines of the area are also recorded in the sediments. Recently, geologically speaking, Lake Lysan, from around 70 to 14,000 years ago, covered the entire area of the Jordan Valley, stretching from Lake Kinneret in the north to around 35 kilometers south of the present-day Dead Sea. The fingerprint of Lake Lysan is in the uniform sediment of up to 40 meters thick, which it deposited during its existence. The high stand of Lake Lysan was around 27,000 years ago, when its surface was about 180 meters below sea level. That's nearly 250 meters higher than the current dead sea level of 427 meters below sea level. Then around 19,000 years ago, Lake Lysen began to decline. During certain periods, it dropped very quickly, and there is some evidence that it may have dropped as low as 700 meters below sea level before slowly refilling. The dead sea is 306 meters deep, making the bottom currently at 733 below meters mean world sea level. Sorry for all the numbers. Again, tectonics likely played an important part in the changes to the levels, as well as changes to the climate in the area, which is dictated by the Mediterranean, regional deserts, the dramatic changes in elevation, and of course global climate patterns. Archaeology supports the evidence presented in the geology. The early human cultures of the area, the Kibarian and Natufian, who existed during the highest levels of Lake Lysen, present no archaeology low than around 200 meters below sea level, i.e. they did not build there because it was all water. As we know, climate changes, and small climate changes would likely impact Israel with its precarious fresh water availability very hard. We do know that during the late Greek early Roman period, the water level of the Dead Sea was over 30 meters higher than today. This was significant as many of the low level transport routes around the sea would have been disrupted with the sea this deep, requiring diversions up the steep sides of the valley. Now we are all experts on Israeli hydrology, it's worth returning to tectonics. Let's look at what has been previously recorded about earthquakes in the region. I'll detail a couple for you and leave the rest for you to peruse at your leisure. August the 22nd, 502 CE. Ptolemaeus, Acre and Nicopolis destroyed. Destruction at Tyre, Sidon, Beirut and Byblos. May the 20th to 29th, 526 CE. Antioch destroyed by earthquake and fire. 
250 to 300,000 dead aftershocks for 18 months. 551 CE, a large and terrible earthquake took place in the territories of Palestine, Arabia, Mesopotamia, Syria and Phoenicia. Tyre, Sidon, Beirut, Tripoli and Byblos suffered much damage and many thousands of people were killed. A part of a mountain fell down, forming a harbour in Botro. The sea went back for 1,000 feet and many ships sunk. 749 CE, Galilee earthquake. It's now thought to have caused hundreds of kilometers of the Dead Sea Fault to shift an average of 1.5 meters in an instant. It devastated cities across the region. Contemporary reports state that a village near Mount Tabor had moved a distance of four miles and that entire towns had been swallowed by the earth. The 12th century saw a series of devastating earthquakes with possibly a quarter million or more deaths. 1683, an earthquake caused a village to to shift with its houses and trees from the top of a mountain to the bottom of a valley, but without any damage. Another series of quakes in October and November 1759 destroyed all of the villages of the Becca Valley, affected all of the coastal towns, and was felt from Damascus to Cairo. These few reports, and the many available in the references, illustrate very clearly why we do not rely solely on what we read. It's undoubted that these earthquakes were severe and caused widespread devastation devastation and death, but I would not expect anyone to take these accounts as the literal truth of each of these events. The archaeological and geological record does provide evidence of the earth movements, the widespread destruction and the demise of certain urban centres and resurgence of others as a result of the earthquakes. The most recent biggie in the immediate vicinity was the 1927 Jericho earthquake, which affected Jericho, Jerusalem, Tiberias and destroyed much of historic Nablus, with an estimated 500 deaths. Experts suspect that another big shake-up is overdue. As the two sides of the fault push against each other, tension is built up which must be released. A minor earthquake swarm in October 2013 reminded people of this fact and prompted the usual doom-gloom fabrications and failed prophecies from the kooks and con artists from Nancy Leader to Paul Begley. A more sober piece in the Guardian newspaper explains that Israel routinely carries out natural disaster exercises and builds for earthquakes, but that the big one could leave 7,000 dead and 200,000 homeless. So what do we know? The Dead Sea is known for its salt formations. It has an active fault system running down the middle of it and a history of very destructive earthquakes. I should add to this that the Dead Sea is a source of bitumen asphalt, oil, natural gas and sulphur. Now, if you are one of those people who think that some supernatural entity has a bias for punishing people who happen to live in earthquake, hurricane, tornado or coastal zones, then there is little that I, or William of Ockham, can do for you. Either you credit your god with controlling the interaction of every atomic particle in the entire universe on a continual basis, or you come up with a better explanation for why he throws in an earthquake here and a hurricane there just for kicks, but of course is not responsible for the things you don't want him to be responsible for. If you are a reasonably sceptical person and hear or read a story about violent destruction which occurs on an active tectonic plate boundary, destruction that mentions fire and brimstone, sulphur, in an area where natural gas and sulphur seep out of the earth, then you might pause to ask yourself what is most likely that some historic destruction, which was due to the natural force forces of an earthquake, one of innumerable destructive earthquakes that have happened throughout history, was attributed to supernatural causes by a scientifically illiterate, superstitious people. Or that some supreme being, capable of creating matter from non-matter, who can make donkeys talk and snakes dance, lacks the imagination or foresight to bring destruction to miscreants using some unique means which could not be easily dismissed by intelligent, scientifically literate people as simple natural processes. And Lot's wife getting turned into a pillar of salt in an area absolutely dominated by salt. Really? Is this meant to come from the imagination of the being who gave us the platypus? So, whatever happened in Israel, at Jericho, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the other biblical cities destroyed by shaking, fire and brimstone, it wasn't God's fault. It was plate tectonics' fault. Thanks for watching and putting up with my voice, which is on its way out.